Today I'm just going to tell, talk to you about some of my experiences as, as a designer in my life and design, how I found design, and uh, show you a ton of work I've done through the years. So I've been a designer since uh, 97. I graduated in 96. So over 20 years I've been doing design consultancy, uh, working in different spaces of different industries. And uh, so hopefully today is, is going to be entertaining. I'm going to tell you a lot of stories, but also I have a couple lessons in there to kind of make a little educational so you can walk away with some things, some, some things to, to apply to your own design, your own thinking, uh, as well as um, just show you a bunch of work. Because it's always fun to see different levels of, of design and, and the process. Um, so yeah, as I, as I mentioned, our, my presentation today is go a little bit back into my history uh, and how I found design. Uh, most of my career has been spent at IDEO. Um, I just left IDEO about two weeks ago after being there for almost 17 years. So I have, have a lot of stories from IDEO and a lot of philosophies and design and that learnings from that company. And then uh, within that company, I've had three different kind of chapters. So I worked in the toy inventions studio, which called the Toy Lab. I also worked in our general design group and, and got to do a wide range of projects. So like medical devices, sporting goods, consumer electronics, all kinds of stuff. And then I finished my career in the San Francisco studio working on a food project. So doing a lot of food, food and packaging, uh, learning more about branding and kind of bringing all that together in like a holistic design. And then I'm going to end with a passion project of mine called Diamond MMA. So my first lesson is to be a good presenter. And this is more for me to remind myself because I really don't enjoy presentations, but I have to do them. And I've gotten really good at them because I have to present. As a designer, it's important that you are a good presenter. And one tip someone gave me was tell a story. Stories are a lot easier to remember for me to tell and for you to remember as, as a listener. So being presented to sometimes could be boring, so I try to mix in a story with my presentations. Uh, also connect with the audience. You know, we, uh, as I went through my PL training, project leadership training, I got to do some, some uh, speaking and and presenting and uh, it's a really good tip to just make sure you're connecting with the audience you know make sure you're making eye contact make sure that um, you know you're, the people in the back are listening and and they're, you're involving them somehow maybe through an exercise or somehow getting them interactive uh, also speak with authority and confidence so this is my power stance here when I want to feel more authoritative and uh, it really works you know there's like psychology that talks about how in this power stance, you become a little bit more powerful and um, authoritative. And sometimes even like at IDEA, we would be on a, a speaker call, like a phone call, and we would actually, instead of sitting down, we would actually stand up and stand like this as we talk to the phone to be more authoritative. Because you can always tell when you're on the phone and someone's on their computer or they're like laying down, they don't sound the same, right? So speaking uh, with confidence. And the way to get there is rehearse. When you rehearse and you know your content, you're gonna be more confident when you speak because you know it. You know, you're more comfortable with it. And if you mess up, you can recover easier. So rehearse, rehearse is one of the biggest lessons I also learned um, through being a good presenter. So this is me as a kid in the middle school and uh, I was played a lot of sports growing up. You, any sport, you name it, I did it. But uh, the one that really captured my attention was wrestling. So this is me winning my first tournament in eighth grade. And uh, I still remember my friend comes over and pulls off my thing. He goes, here, you look tougher if you pull this off. And so I took the picture. And, uh, and it, to me, the wrestling was a really great uh, lessons for life. You know, there was, I learned about dedication and hard work and, uh, and you know, how to compete and how to be humble. And uh, I, I saw that the harder I worked at it, the better I did on the mat. And there's this one-to-one -one translation where I didn't really get that in baseball and soccer. And I feel like design's a lot like that. You know, the harder I try at designing something, the better it comes, it comes out. So it's like a lot about effort, you know, and, and working hard. And so, um, you know, I grew, I grew up in a town, I was born in East Chicago, which is actually over the border in Indiana. And uh, it's, but it's right outside Chicago. And next to Gary, which is like, was probably one of the worst cities in America. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, it's, it was a nice place to grow up. You know, we, we had a lot of fun. It was a lot of outdoor play. And um, we actually, it was really nice. We were by the lake, you know. We were right by Lake Michigan. It's like, in the summertime, it was really nice. But in our backyard was nothing but factories, right? We have steel mills and refineries. And everybody I knew, all my friends, their dads either worked at this place. Everybody was blue collar. And I call myself a blue collar designer. Um, and, 
you know, my dad was a plumber and, I'm, and he had my sister and I and when he was young. So he was going through the tradesman school and he would have this drafting board and he had to learn how to lay down the pipes and, and how to like, you know, it, I thought it was really cool. As a kid, like having a T-square and a, and a triangle and drawing lines and drawing, using the circle templates and like I was really attracted to that for some reason. And, and so I would draw with my dad and, and my uncle was also a really good artist and would draw with him and, and I used to always play outside and make stuff. I would make forts and everything and I'm thinking oh, I'm going to be an architect one day and build my own house and design my own house. So um, can you guess what I wanted to be when I grew up? Anyone? Architect. Anyone else? Engineer. Engineer. Good one. Uh, you're right, professor. <laughs> I tell you, man, sports was my passion, and I really wanted to be a professional wrestler. I used to watch a lot of this on TV, and I wanted to be like Jimmy Superfly, jumping off the top rope. And uh, so I was really, I was like, I want to go down this path of being a professional athlete, and if possible, a professional wrestler. Um, so I ended up getting, uh, doing really well in school and, and really well in um, wrestling. And um, I got a scholarship to go to Purdue. I got recruited by a bunch of different schools and I went to Purdue University, <clears throat> which is a Big Ten school, which is a really tough conference for wrestling. So I was like, really wanted to go there. I got recruited to some other smaller schools, but I really wanted to go wrestle. And so I get to Purdue and this is my dorm. I live in this dorm. I think it's like the largest male dorm in like all of US. So it's all a bunch of men. But, um, um, the school is co-ed. It's a big state school, like 40,000 students. And um, turns out, if you're going to wrestle for the team, you have to declare a major. Well, so I, I went up to the counselor. I'm like, well, <clears throat> I really like to draw. I like to make things. I want to be an architect. And she's like, well, we don't have architecture program here. So I was like, OK, well, maybe what else do you have that I can you know, use my hands and draw? I really don't like to read. <laughs> I was telling someone earlier. like. I wanted to make stuff, you know, I wanted to be creative and like make things. So um, she told me about industrial design, the, the different different design disciplines, you know, graphic design, interior design, and I was like, oh, this sounds interesting. So I like to say that design found me, um, and, but I did find design going away to college. And so I, in school, I loved it. It was, um, it was great. I never looked back, never thought about changing majors. I excelled in all the classes and really enjoyed building things. And I also got to wrestle for the team and, and did really well wrestling and was captain of the team. And, and it was really hard. Like we were talking last week about managing time. You know, I was here, I was training twice a day, traveling for tournaments on the weekends, and I had all these, all these art projects to do. And so I was really trying to be more efficient. I turned out, I actually did better in school during the season because out of the season, there's so much distractions and you like party and you kind of get, get lost a little bit. But um, I was able to do well. And uh, one of my favorite classes, and, and unfortunately, I don't have any of my student work right now. It's all I'm still in a binder. I got to digitize. Um, but um, <clears throat> um, yeah, this is how old I am. I feel like 96 is when I graduated. That was like still, I didn't have an email address. Why would I need that? Who was I going to email? You know, nobody else had one. Um, but uh, I had took this one drawing class. And this is, I think, the fundamental part of design is you have to know how to draw. You don't have to draw good but you can't be afraid to draw. You know, you have to be able to sketch your ideas. As creative designers, we're very visual, and we speak through sketches, right? You know, like, even if it's a stick figure, you know, you gotta be able to draw that and show it to people and, and move the conversation along. And uh, I had this professor, he was, a, he was from Japan, but he worked at Corbett, and he designed interiors, a really good stylist. And we'd have us, every time we'd sit down in these big three-hour classes, he would say, shoot the bird shoot the bird and I was like so he had these things where he would have a sit down oh I had them paper where I'll show you later but he would just say you put a dot on the paper and then you would shoot the bird from different angles and it was all about teaching you line control you know so that you can start developing because you know before I was like sketch your line like this to the dot he's like no quick you know smooth and then and then doing it back you know I have a strong side and a lot of times when I sketch I'll turn the paper you know to get my strong side so when I'm drawing, I'm kind of moving the paper around. That's, that's totally fine. But it's you know, starting to learn how to hit different angles. And so we would do this. And we'd warm up. Just like if you were playing a sport, you had to warm up. You do a little stretching before you start you know, wrestling or whatever. 
So we would warm up every day, and it's something I still practice. And it was one of the biggest lessons I learned was shoot the bird. And so I, before I sit down to draw a design, I would sit there and just draw my lines, you know, kind of warm up my hand. We'd also draw a lot of circles and ellipses and just, you know, and, and again, it was just about getting better at it. And it's something I still practice. It's like learning the basics, but being able to draw and not be afraid to draw is very important. Um, so I did well in school. Got to Russell College, and then, uh, oh, my professor was also like, you have a really playful style. I think you would be really good at doing toys. You know, your stuff is kind of cartoony, and so, and I was like, oh, toys would be fun. I'm kind of like a big kid. I would love to kind of explore that industry. So yeah, I started sending out some resumes and trying to get some jobs. I graduated, and then I was like, you know, something was missing, and I said, so I decided, Stick, stick with my passion. I want to be that professional wrestler. So I ended up moving to Puerto Rico and I made the national team there. And I got to travel all around the world, wrestling in Japan and Russia, Cuba, Venezuela, Colombia, you name it. I was there, I was wrestling tournaments all the time. And I finally made to be, you know, I was a professional athlete. They were paying for me to take these trips and give me a little stipend. And, uh, but then also like after doing that, I, I came one point away in the finals and overtime to qualifying for the Olympics. And after that, it was kind of my dream was crushed. And I'm like, all right, I'm gonna focus on design. I need to get back in. Because I had this passion of, de of design too. You know, I was a builder, I was a maker, I was a creative guy. And um, I was, had some, and I had some resumes out there and it turned out I got a call from a, a toy invention studio in Chicago. And so, yeah, it's kind of coincidence that that picture looks like that. But um, this was the first toy I, got to, I designed. So I worked for a, a company called London Company. So Bruce Lund was this independent inventor, and he hired me, and there was a team of us. There was like eight or nine designers, all toy inventors. And uh, it was a lot of fun, because we come up with our own ideas. You build a rapid prototype, and you pitch it to a company. They try to get them to buy the idea. So you know, it was, it was like really creative, like you're just like brainstorming all the time, building stuff, and it felt like I was back in school, but they're getting paid for it, and I was like presenting these ideas to different toy companies, and it was something I didn't really think of, uh, was, you know, when I thought of traditional design, it was more an inventor, you know, and I felt like I'm an inventor now, too, so on top of being a designer, I'm an inventor, and I was coming up with new, new concepts. Um, this one, the Twizzler Giggler, was, uh, we'd worked on some candy companies, and that you would have to like, uh, it came up this feature with this little reed that would you know, whistle the inside and as you shake them to get the licorice out it would like make a giggle sound so it was the Twizzler giggler and so I love coming up with these little cool fun features um, so that was great and uh, what was cool was that every year they had a the International Toy Fair in New York City every February you go there all the companies are there presenting their new products and uh, inventors are there and buyers are there and all the toy industries there and I'm in a showroom and I see this guy walking into a showroom and he's got cauliflower ears. And if you guys know anything about wrestling, wrestlers usually have these big cauliflower ears because their ears get a little banged up from, from uh, combat. And so I bump into this guy and I was like, hey, wrestlers are not allowed in the showroom. We can't have any wrestlers in the showroom. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm not a wrestler, I'm a designer. I go, where'd you get the ear from? And he's like, oh yeah, I wrestled at Stanford. Now I'm a, a toy inventor at this company, IDEO. I was like, cool, yeah, I think I heard of them. Um, and uh, I was like, yeah, I'm a toy inventor in Chicago. And I was like, cool, so we kind of exchanged business cards. Well, six months later, I got laid off. It was like uh, 2000, and I ended up um, packing up my car. I was like, I'm not wrestling, my apartment's overdue, and um, I'm just gonna pack up my car and live with a friend on, the, on his couch in San Francisco. So I moved out here, and I call up Jeff Grant, the guy I met, um, and I said, hey, I'm looking for a job. Um, and he's like, oh, cool, you should come down and visit our studio. So he invited me to come down. I did a little tour. I was like, oh, this is a nice place, you know? And at the time, the toy studio was separate from the rest of IDEO. And, uh, and so I thought, you know, I'm getting hired to do this toy mention job, which I'm good at and I have some experience. And so I was like, yeah, I'll do it for a year or two, you know, try it out. Um, and like I said, that was like 2000. So like 17 years, I'd end up staying at IDEO because uh, I love working with this group and it was a, a, a kind of a different w approach to toy invention. It was a little bit more team oriented where before it was more like I'm trying to design and like uh, trying to get these bonuses based on my invention. Um, and it was really cool. We built a lot of stuff and one of the big 
things I learned was just to build everything, right? So um, my old boss in the toy lab, Brendan Boyle, would say, you know, picture's worth a thousand words and a prototype's worth a thousand pictures. Not sure if he made that quote up, but he would always say that. And it was really true when it came to toy invention because if you can't prove out your idea, no one's gonna buy it. You know, like it's hard to sell an idea on just a sketch. So here's my second lesson, get physical. And I probably prototype more than uh, most designers because that's just the way I like to think. I kind of like, like to build it and then go back and design it. And, and so I, um, you know, this build to think is something that IDEO talks a lot about and something I've really embraced. And um, also, yeah, and sometimes you hit those walls like you, you're, you're kind of sketching or you don't have ideas. I just start making stuff, playing with material, coming up with ideas. And that was really important in the toy lab. And then um, prove it to yourself and others. You know, there, there's been times where I had a mentor say, I'm like, yeah, they don't get my idea. He's like, well, prove it to them. Like, build it and prove it to them this is a cool idea. And then in that process, you can kind of prove it to yourself, too. And uh, prototype the experience. So, you know, I used to think of design as just being like this form of something, this object. But this object has to be interactive with, you know. And so building this prototype, now you start to learn about how people are going to hold it, how they're going to interact with the buttons, um, how this thing in interacts within the environment. So think about how that prototype can take you to new places. And always bring a prototype to me. So um, that's one of the, another fellow IDEO used to say this all the time, like always show up to, everybody loves to be tangible and touch things and like be physical. So um, it really helps to kind of drive conversations when you're in meetings. So have a prototype with you. So here's uh, one of the first toy projects I did, and uh, it was called the Fit Finder Extreme. So when I, when I joined the toy group, uh, they already had this Fit Finder game. It was doing well. And uh, they asked, hey, can you design the next version of it, this extreme version? It was, it's like a lie detector game for, for girls' slumber parties, but it's super fun. I actually brought it with. We'll play with it later. And uh, you put your fingers on it, and you ask your friend a question, and it lights up yes, telling the truth, red if it's lying, or yellow, not sure. And it's just, it's a fun way to spark conversation. And we called it magic eight ball technology. You know, it's kind of random, but it, just the act of doing it was fun. Because like, if it wasn't your answer, you go, oh, answer it again, do it again, you know, until you get the answer and then everyone laughs. Um, but you could see a little foam model. I used to do a lot of foam sculpture. We didn't have the 3D, 3D printers yet. So I get the surf foam and I love carving and sculpting. I took some sculpting classes in college. Um, so I really embrace like getting tangible with the foam and create them and I would paint it and make it look like a nice bottle. Some, some early photoshopping there. Um, another project product I worked on was uh, the swing and glide or glide and swing. I can't even remember the title now, but it's, um, it was taking a baby swing and I, you can see in this prototype, I just took an existing swing and I figured that if you can change this pivot point, you can go from a swing to more of a glide, which is important for babies and trying to get them to quiet now when they're crying. So. Um, with some ABS, you know, I was able to make two hinge points and make it an easy adjustment, and that turned into a toy invention idea that, that we sold to Fisher Price. Um, another one we sold to Fisher Price was a, was a Quizzer the Wonder Wizard. He was like this dog, but originally we presented it as the Whiz Kid. He knew everything about everything. So he, you'd plug in these different backpacks for different genres, and you could see just as a, I used to do a lot of marker sketching and rendering that way too. Uh, <clears throat> I got to work on some play sets and again using like paper and foam core to kind of just build them out. Uh, There's a sketch and then the engineers can actually create these uh, to blow molded parts. Uh, this is just a, a rendering I did for some cars way back. You know, like I had this idea where you plug in your iPod and you fill the, fill the car with music and it goes farther or faster depending on the beat per minute. Um, uh, but uh, again, a lot of prototyping. Everything we we, we, every idea we had, we had a prototype with it, and we also started doing a lot of videos. So every prototype, we would do a video because it was so much easier to convey the concept through a, like a 20 second, 30 second sizzle commercial than to have to sit down for half an hour and play a game with someone that you know, is losing their attention. So we did prototypes and videos for everything. And you can see I, was, I use a foam core a lot, and I still use foam core a lot. Like this is one of those basic needs of a designer. And I, I got to sit in the class and see some really cool foam core chairs last week. Um, but it, it's awesome material. And you can see how I moved from that into some acrylic and made this Barbie fashion case that you pull behind and unfolds. And then this was just a block of wood. 
that I painted and put some stickers on and then threw the video and made it look like it was lighting up and, and um, making sound effects. So like using like really crude stuff to make a prototype. This was also like just some PVC pipe and some existing buttons off another toy. I made this really fun game called the Funny Bone. And, uh, and it was one of my favorite games. Unfortunately, we never sold the idea, but it was really cool. Um, and then that was another foam prototype. I, um, I'm kind of just showing you stuff that I actually had, but I probably worked on hundreds of toy different concepts, you know, through the years. Um, sure, some of the ones that did make it to market um, was Pickup Lines, which is an adult, an adult game, kind of like apples to apples for adults. And it's also very fun to play with the crowd. Um, this uh, Cranium was a big toy company. We were doing a lot of games for like five years where Cranium was a hot new game and they were a big company growing and we came up, um, we did a whole brainstorm on just funny names. And we came up with this name, Junk in the Trunk. And we're like, oh, what can we do with Junk in the Trunk? And we came up with this idea of like putting things in, inside the trunk, like Tetris, before the timer comes up and then it, you know, if not, it ejects and all the pieces go everywhere. Um, they end up calling it um, Jam Pack Jam. I, I still like junk, junk in the trunk better. But, um, and then the iGames, you saw that, uh, this, again, when iPods came out, everyone was like, how do we capture this I, I music into a game? Um, so that was my, like my toy design career. I was about seven years at, in the toy studio in Palo Alto. And I just started getting really curious about the rest of IDEO. You know, we have, I'm working for this bigger company, and I've seen all these really cool presentations. And uh, you know, we did a lot of like just in Toy Lab, just coming up. You know, we knew kids, we knew play, we knew toys. We would just come up with the ideas and, and execute. Where um, I was curious about design research, you know, and, and going out or more refined design, and wanted to get more into, you know, rendering and 3D modeling. So uh, I pushed myself. I leave in my comfort zone of the Toy Lab, and I joined our general design group. And so in Palo Alto, that we do a lot of engineering and some, some really cool stuff, and a lot of it's tangible. Um, but this is where I really start to learn about human-centered design. You know, IDEO preaches human-centered design. It's kind of our philosophy, and now a lot of other companies do it too. But um, really, I had, to, I had to learn this because I'm now designing things I'm not an expert in. I don't have experience in these other industries. And so um, I started thinking of like how a method actor will then like try to learn and live the life of this person they're trying to act. And so I thought maybe this is way kind of I can do um, design research, like live in that moment, like whatever it is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it on, I'm gonna experiment on myself and try to get into that emotional side of things. So I just, I didn't have a quote for this. I just looked this up on Wikipedia, but method acting is a range of training and rehearsal techniques that seek to encourage sincere and emotionally expressive performances. And so this is gonna lead to my next lesson. Um, which is all about um, becoming a method designer. So I'm, I don't know, I'm trying to coin, coin something, something new here. Um, but you'll see in the next couple of slides that I, you know, I would really embrace these projects. And um, you know, building empathy through those personal experiences is one way I felt I can get into the mindset of the consumer. Um, and, this, and not only just designing for the object, but design for that emotion that you want the people to feel. So like kind of thinking a little bit more emotional and more um, less about the tangible, but those untangible things that make something really unique and different. Um, and we would go out and do a lot of observa observation. You know, we would go look at people in context because when you have people in a focus group and you're looking through one-way mirror, they're not really being themselves. So when you go into their home and you get to observe what they're doing, and they'll tell you, oh yeah, I'm very organized, but then when you get to their house, it's a mess, right? Like people want to tell you things that they, that they want to be, but when you actually see in real life what they're, how they're living, it, it's different, you know? So I got to go into you know, people's bathrooms and look in people's fridges and like travel with people, and like it's really interesting to start to um, listen with your eyes, you know? Be, be observant. Um, Involve the consumer in the design process. You know, you, I, I've been seeing this already here. Like, you go out and you talk to consumers. You know, you, you want to design for the end user, so talk to those end users right away and start to get some, develop a point of view, get some insights, get some inspiration. So that's always really important. But then also, like, circle them back in to get feedback on your concepts. You know, that's something that we did a lot of at IDEO. We're always involving the consumer um, as well as the client. And getting their opinions is important, too. Um, but we would also look for extreme users. So as we would go out to learn about something, 
Um, there's a great story about how we were designing all these kitchen gadgets and instead of talking to someone that might use a pizza cutter you know, once a week, once a month, we would talk to the guy that works at the pizza parlor and all day he's doing this, you know, to get his perspective on this new pizza cutter. And then we'd also put it in the hands of a kid who never gets to cut a pizza, right? So, and then their hands are small and they hold things differently. You know, they hold their toothbrush like this. So like learning from these extreme users, we're able to inspire ideas that then will push the design. And so that's uh, something that we preach a lot to and practice. So, so I'm in the general design group. And uh, any questions? Any questions? I know I'm talking fast. I have a lot of slides, but if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, so my next chapter, I'm in the design group, and uh, I was like, oh, cool. So I wonder what my first project's going to be. And they're like, well, you know, you have all this experience with kids, and, you know, so we're going to push you the other way. We're going to go down. We want, to, we want you to design some diapers. <laughs> So, like I said, it was general design group. It was a wide variety of stuff. So I was like, wow, man, I'm designing diapers now. This is, I guess it's cool. Um, so uh, this was really cool. We got to see the lab where they um, actually test these things. And it was really interesting. Um, but uh, I said, well, how am I going to learn about this? I need to put myself into that, that mindset, right, of a baby. <laughs> so we went, I went out and bought a bunch of adult diapers and had the, the whole team wore them. And like, he, this is just a photo of wearing on the outside, but I actually wore them under my pants and like went to sleep with them. I was on the Caltrain wearing diapers, you know, and just trying to like feel out where are these pain points that a baby can't express with how they're feeling about these diapers. So, um, but just put myself in that experience and diving deep into that helped me to come up with tons of ideas. Um, and our client was, I mean, I, was, I have a couple, it's hard to see these, but a bunch of different diaper ideas, you know, trying to stay within their technology, but there's different ways where you can make it more efficient, easier to change, prevent blowouts in the back, you know, like we came up with tons of ideas and our clients were like super happy. Um, another one that I have no clue about was medical devices. You know, I had to design a midline catheter um, for pick nurses. And I'm like, I never, you know, have, have you know, I, sure, I can do that. So uh, we went out and we observed, we went to some hospitals, we talked to some nurses, we watched them do this opera um, operation. But, so a, a, a catheter is basically an IV. The IVs are usually down in your lower vein, but the, this uh, midline catheter has to go in your upper arm where your vein's bigger so they can administer uh, different drugs. So the needle has to be bigger to put this tube. And it really sucks when you poke a patient and then while you're trying to put the catheter in, it comes out of the vein. Now you gotta poke them again. So they wanted to improve this, and so they asked for our help. And so we, we got to a test vein, and we got to t you know, try this on, and you know, um, learn just, just by doing. You know, and they wouldn't let us test on real people, but um, testing on this vein was uh, really interesting. We came up with a bunch of concepts. You see some sketches back there, and our, our, final, our final design looked like that. So this was the existing one, and the problem was you would insert the needle into the vein, then you had to slide this thing down, but then your thumb was in the way. You had to switch your hands and then finish deploying the catheter. And so during that transition, you would lose the needle sometimes. So um, what we did was we moved all the controls up to the front, had in the back, um, and they had something like that if you hold it in from the very back, but you know, it's, it's hard to, you, you want control, you want to be up close. And, um, and they had this lock that held the needle stiff. So what we did is we bent the needle using this uh, curve, and that gave enough tension to make it stiff, but the thing was still split, so as the, the catheter went through, it deployed, and it was really successful, and this also made it, you know, after a couple years of testing, when you do medical devices, it takes a long time uh, uh, to test these things and vet them out, but uh, this is on the market and doing well. Um, one of my f best, or my favorite projects, and people always ask you, Addy, oh, what's your favorite project? Um, and I always tell them the one I'm working on right now, which I'll get to later. But this, um, this was an obstacle course called Tough Mudder. You guys heard of that? So it's an you know, obstacle. You run through the mud. It's 10, 12 miles through rough terrain. And there's all these obstacles. And it's really fun. And this company, is, it was growing. And they said, we want to learn your process. Because we're trying to grow. We want to learn the ideal process so we can come up with more cool stunts and help our company grow. So we said, well, why don't we do a project where we 
we go ahead and design stuff and we'll take you along the journey. So this happened a lot at IDEO and that's where we brought a lot of value. We were able to bring the a client along and teach them uh, our design process. So again, we had to put ourselves in the mindset of the consumer. So we ran the race, right? For, we went down SoCal, ran a race, brought a team of IDEOers. Um, the, fi the finish line is all these electric wires and you run through and you get shocked and you fall and it really sucks, but it's fun to watch other people get hurt. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun running it and we, we talked to a bunch of mutters afterwards and, and got some insights and went back and just started sketching a bunch of ideas. Um, <laughs> And so uh, these are some like pencil sketches. And it's funny, like I, I, I have a couple different sketching styles. Sometimes I use like the, the Prisma pencils and some markers. Other times it's like a fine line pen um, or I'll draw on, on the computer. But um, yeah, some of these ideas, that we, we showed them to the uh, client and then we said, well, you need to come here and do a workshop. We need, you need to experience this. So we built these, we built these like, they, these are like small scale compared to what they would do on the course, right? But these are life size that you can experience, and we had this. We had them send over those wires that shock view, and we had, we had, uh, we had this a concept where you get squeezed through two barrels, and there was like bungee cords, and we played around with the tension of that. And you need it. And the whole thing about this tough mutter, which makes it really fun, is that it's you, it's you're trying. It's camaraderie. You're trying to help your fellow mutter or your teammate through this thing. It's not really a race. You don't get a. Everybody gets a beer and a T-shirt at the end, but it, you. Um, you know, you, you, they wanted obstacles where you need more than one person to get through. So this was a really fun one. We turned the whole grassy uh, courtyard at, down in Palo Alto into a, a mud run. Um, we had another one where it was like a balance beam and, we, and they wanted to involve participation of the crowd because people go to watch their loved ones get hurt and muddy. And so we had this idea where the people watching can pull on strings and punching bags and tires will knock them off. Um, and then we, we came up with six final concepts and, and uh, some of them they actually implemented it and we got to go back like six months later with like a team of 20 people and so it was a lot of fun. Uh, the last one story in this section is um, this was a, a company called Knit Health which is started by three former IDOers and they have an office not too far from here. Um, they're, they're a total startup but they, um, they had this idea, they had this technology with this camera that can see through like using infrared through like clothings and blankets. So they thought if we can monitor the baby's breathing at night in the dark, we can tell a lot of information that's plugged to an app. Um, and that would be, um, you know, if the baby's coughing, sneezing, if it's sick, it's waking up, the type of breath, you know, if he's breathing at all. So really important things that can be connected back to the doctor's health and going through this internet of things. Um, and they wanted to be have a tripod that's mounted on a dresser looking down. So I designed this thing that looked kind of cute, kind of like a, be in, in a nursery, but not but a little bit more sophisticated. And they also had this little dongle that the parents would carry around and that that would inform them, you know, through the lights and sensors and sounds. Well, it turns out they took this out in the field and they, they made like 50 of these things and was testing them. And nobody wants to carry around another electronic device around the house. You know, you already got your phone. If you like me, you carry your phone in your pajama pocket. Um, you don't want to carry around another device. And nobody really had the dresser in the right position of the crib. So they came back and said, can we redesign this thing to hang from the wall? So we designed a new base for it. We kind of refined the design, tightened it all up. Um, and, uh, and also, because it's up on the wall, it's going to be more visible. So we kind of went more white, kind of. Uh, hide away. Um, so this is a really cool company. You guys should look them up, give them a plug. Um, but I'm, I'm going to be helping these guys with some future work. Um, so then my next chapter, I end up, um, and I was having kids and I wanted to be closer to home and I was like, I want to work in San Francisco office. It was growing and it was doing a lot of cool projects out of there. And I was actually getting staffed on a lot of these food projects. And so I'm not really much of a foodie or a chef, but I like food, you know, and I was like, I'll try that. And I, I, I also like packaging, you know. I was like, oh, that'd be cool because everything that you sell in food has a packaging, unless it's like a fruit or vegetable, and they have their own natural packaging. But I was like, I can bring some value to this group through my industrial design. And uh, this is a new medium that I have never really worked with in food. So I thought it'd be really cool. And um, one of the lessons I learned was like, you have to have a strong opinion, but loosely held. Um, and so what that means is like, you know, now I'm working 
with food scientists and chefs and brand managers and business designers and, and, and before it was a little bit more designers and engineers and they were speaking my language. But now I had to like, everybody's got a strong point of view. Everybody has, a, okay, this is what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna do it. And so, but you wanna be, you wanna be able to like, have a strong opinion so you can move forward in the project, but not so strong where you're kind of blocking other people out or even blocking your own ideas out. So it was a really great quote. Um, and so my next lesson is around um, design is holistic. And we were talking a little bit about this today with somebody. Um, but, um, you know, everybody's got their expertise. So leverage that the expertise of the team. Like everybody bring something to the table. Um, and, and Ideal likes to look for people who are T-shaped. So you have a, a depth, you have an expertise within some category or some skill set. Um, but you can kind of talk across the board, right? You're kind of T-shaped. And so um, leveraging the team is very important. And then uh, trust the process. And, you know, design can be very foggy at times. You're not sure where you're going with it. Um, but you have to trust the process that if you do these things, you do these, you know, do this research, do these brainstorms, do this prototyping, things will start to evolve and, and, and uh, things will come to life. Um, involve the client. So we like to involve the client a lot. And we like, you know, this, one of the, the selling points is like, we're going to teach you our process. And a lot of companies now can do the process and we have tools out there and that whole IDOU thing. Um, <clears throat> but um, involving the client, I like to say like, Instead of me going away for, you know, say a six week project and coming back, do you like design one, two, or three? They were a part of the journey. They were a part of the research. They were part of the mid-phase workshop where we brainstormed together. If I can get this guy to be a champion of this idea, it's gonna go further within his organization. Um, and so when I go to the final, now it's one A, one B, or one C. You know, you're closer in to what they really need because you've gotten that information from the client. Um, they've hired you because they, you have a point of view and you have a skill set they might need, but you know, listening to them, involving them is always really important. Um, oh, consider the next steps. Um, again, this is, you're going to do part of this project. It might be a 12-week project, but eventually it's going to go on to another phase, you know, whether it be manufacturing or marketing or more consumer insights and testing. It's going to go on. So I, I always like to ask the client, like, okay, the brief says you need this, but what are your next steps? What are you going to do next? How can it help you be successful, set you up for your next step, you know? So sometimes briefs will change a little bit, you know, like, actually, we don't need three to five ideas. We actually just need, like, one or two good ones, you know, or uh, I would rather have more prototypes to get tangible to put in people's hands for another round of testing, or can we do more technical stuff versus conceptual stuff? So. Sometimes the scope of the project changes, you know, as you start to explore and unfold. Okay, so my last chapter, the last thing I want to share with you is um, a passion project of mine. Um, so you guys know I do a lot of wrestling, um, and I was uh, able to start to mix the two together, design and my wrestling, um, and but. Uh, I wanted to leave a quote here. So you've probably heard this quote before, but I just love it. It feels like, you know, design, you know, you, you have to work hard at it to have good, good outcomes. And so, you know, to, genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. And so you have to put the time in, you know, these designs just don't happen. And uh, so I, I believe that you know, through wrestling and working hard and having that work ethic, it's carried over to my design career and I've been able to do well because of that. Um, but it's also really important to follow your passion. You know, when you are passionate about something, you're gonna work harder at it. So find what you're excited about and, and build a brand, build your brand around that or a skill set. So it's nice that the school has um, these avenues where you, you know, after a couple of years, you can choose shoe design or toys, automotive. And this is awesome. You're in a good position to kind of find your passion here. Um, but if not, keep looking, keep following it. Um, so your current project is your favorite project. And, and I learned this from another, uh, one of my bosses at IDEO. He was like, if you can't be excited about what you're working on now, then you're not gonna do as good of a job. So even though this last one was your, maybe your favorite, you need to work on this one. You need to get excited about what you're working on now. And you can do that through different ways. You can get excited about the process. Maybe it's the team of people you're working with. Maybe, maybe it's the product or the client that you can get around and get, get excited about. Um, or push yourself, learn a new tool, you know, like 
um, find a way to kind of get excited about that project, whether you like it or not. Um, and then uh, you're only as good as your last project. That's kind of like how I approached the projects. Like I wanted to do good at every project I was on. I, I didn't want to have like, I look back and be like, oh, I did really bad there. You know, like I had some bad projects, but I, I approach every project as if it was my last and try to work hard at it. And uh, don't be afraid to fail. You know, uh, David Kelly, the founder of IDEO, he has this quote, fail often to succeed sooner. You might have heard that, it's very famous. But uh, so true, like when you're, and that's the power of prototyping, like don't try to perfect the first prototype, just do it rough, do it raw, you know, use paper, use foam core, use hot glue, like make, make a mess, like, and then you, you learn from that model, you can take that and put it in people's hands and, and you learn and teach yourself and become, uh, you know, learn from your failures and then eventually you succeed. So, so, okay, so. <laughs> So I do a lot of fighting now. So I was coaching at Stanford, like mid 2000s, and I started meeting all these fighters are coming around. The sport of MMA is growing, and they're like, "Oh, can you teach me some takedowns?" And then I started showing up at this gym and working out with these guys, and and these guys are all professional fighters. Some of them fight in the UFC, which is the highest league. Um, some of them fight in local. There's a, there's a, three of these guys have a fight coming up at the Kizar next weekend. Um, so it's fun to teach wrestling. But I, after practice, I always hear these guys complain about like, oh man, it's harder to keep my mouthpiece in or my cup, you know, and they're always like shifting things around. And so like, oh, do, we might be able to help you with that. So um, I actually, I finally made it into a professional ring um, as a coach for the UFC, uh, one of my fighters, Ramsey Nijim. Um, but um, everybody kept saying, I hate wearing my cup. I hate wearing my jock. And I was like, well, what are you wearing? So there's, there's a steel cup, it's a Muay Thai cup where you have basically, it's a hard, it's a metal steel cup and you tie a shoestring around this way and then one goes through the crack, you tie it off and it's very uncomfortable, but it protects, like if you get kicked there, you're gonna break your foot. Um, and the other one is like, uh, you know, just a big brand, but all, everybody's doing the same thing. Everyone's like, has two straps that kind of hug your butt cheeks, but the cup still moves around, which could actually do more damage. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's a lot of extreme positions when you're, you know, rolling around. So I was like, all right, there's, there's something here. I can, and, and originally, I partnered with a friend uh, from Chicago, Craig Diamond, and he's like, I got this brand, Diamond MMA, and I'm selling t-shirts, but they're not selling that well. I, all the fighters want me to sponsor them and give them money to wear my t-shirt, and I, I want something where people are going to come to me and buy my product because it's the best. So we started, I was like, well, there's this need, like, guys need better groin protection. So, you know, I came up with the, the groin aid, like the grenade. Um, <laughs> did a bunch of sketches and like trying to knock off, like integrate that steel Muay Thai cup with the other uh, traditional cup, jock strap. And uh, we came out with this, this product. It's a four strap jock. We filed for a patent and got it. And we have the multi strap, so we can do five straps, six straps. But four straps, all you really need to keep that cup in place. And it works awesome. And then we went through a lot of different iterations. You know, started with like, cutting up yoga mats in my garage and like hot gluing uh, other shorts and jocks together and you know doing a hand sewing and then got a, a pattern maker involved a seamstress and helped us build some more robust prototypes then we i took them back to the gym i was like here guys try these on tell me what you think and uh, everyone's like this is awesome you know so it's just a couple more minor tweaks some more iterations some different colors uh, applied our branding to it and uh yeah it's a success so like pretty much all the guys in the UFC, a lot of top fighters are wearing them, um, and we're just scratching the surface. I want to get into other brands, other sports, team sports, you know, hockey, football, lacrosse. There's a lot of other people that need groin protection. Uh, it's funny, we actually have people buying these for paintball, for military, for other things we weren't even thinking about, but um, yeah, the four strap jocks was doing well, and we're like, well, we need our own cup. We can't just put any cup in here. So we designed a cup, um, which is, uh, super comfortable. I bought like every cup on the market, kind of traced the outline, kind of find a good size, did some CAD work, 3D printed them, tried them on, let other people try them on. And then we, we had to just bite the bullet and buy the tools to make the, the like a real hard plastic rubber mold that we wanted. But there's features in the cup that are embedded into the plastic and the rubber that uh, flex, you know, as you move. Um, but it's super strong. It's got this diamond faceted shape that mixed well with our brand. And we even put this like jewel in the middle. Um, and then, uh, 
And then we, a lot of guys like to wear spandex over the jock, so we're like, well, let's just sew our jock into this, the shorts. So, so we had the compression jock, which is kind of a new product in our new product category. Um, and so some guys love this, some just want the jock only. Um, and, uh, and so here's one of my fighters wearing, wearing our product in the ring. Uh, this is Josh Berkovich early. Uh, this is actually, this might have even been a prototype he was wearing at the time. But um, you can see these extreme movements you go in and you want to return to the right place and not have things shift. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time now just like um, selling and working with buyers and doing ad banners. So this is just a, an ad banner recently created to show the product line. Um, I've recently created some packaging because we're starting to sell more toward gyms and like um, just uh, retail stores. Most of our sales are online, but um, you know, to, to, a lot of these local gyms, these fight clubs, you know, they have their little pro shop in the corner, so they want 10 units, you know, and <clears throat> so I created some packaging. Um, I just recently launched this new product. So you only really need the cup when you're like sparring and doing like striking, but there's days where you just want to do some jujitsu or some running or some fitness or some weights, and, but you still want support. So I create this product here, it's a compression brief. So it's a brief sewn into the compression short. If you ever wore like the compression short, you know, you kind of pull them down right here and things are loose again, right? So you kind of want them snug and that's what the brief does inside. And so I'm excited about this one, how this can have more potential to other kind of athletes. Um, and we've done some trade shows and you know, we kind of really starting to build up this brand. So I'm really excited about, and um, one of the things I'm going to be pursuing um, in, the, in the next recent uh, couple months, um, as well as a bunch of new product ideas I have for this brand. So looking to get into more protection gear for women. I have a couple athletes I train, women fighters. Um, so they've been like, hey, what about us? You know, so um, <clears throat> yeah. So my last question to you all is, what's your story? And thank you. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat>